Hey everybody, so this is, uh, I guess you can call me Sanryu, which is one of my characters' his names from uh, Guild Wars 2. Now I've never made a video before and I'm not as known as, I guess, Wooden Potatoes or Mad Visual or, well I guess that would be it, I don't know anybody else that would video about Guild Wars 2, but I've never made a video as I said, and you know what, after what was announced, I feel like I, maybe I have something to contribute and yeah well here I am and oh uh, I may have an accent English is not my first language so if you feel uncomfortable with that or it's bothering you well feel free to just close the tab and go do something else play the game I guess so everybody and their mothers know that uh, Arena Net announced uh, just a few weeks ago the first expansion for Guild Wars 2 which is titled Heart of Thorns. That is going to bring a lot of new and exciting things to the game, adding a lot of content and adventures and from what I've heard, outposts and uh, strongholds and new professions, new mechanics, masteries, whatever. That sounds exciting and awesome. But what is going to be added to the old existing content? That is also very exciting because actually ArenaNet said yes, we are adding the masteries and different ways to apply them in the old world that you are already familiar with. But the developers have been very keen on announcing that they want the world to feel alive and always changing for the player. So that led me to ask myself a question and that question would be what needs to evolve in the world for us to feel that something is moving forward, that something is changing, that what we do or what we experience in the story is actually having an impact in the lives of the Tyrians. And uh, well, I managed to compile a list of, I don't know, I didn't number them, but I have a few, quite a few of them actually, and I want to touch briefly on each one. If you agree with the list, great, just uh, leave me a comment, and if you don't, also leave a comment, let me know what you think about this. So uh, the first one would be the Char Human Peace Talks that we can see in the map that is called the Fields of Ruin. They are uh, taking place uh, some miles north of what we know as Ivonhawk, the stronghold of the human resistance. So, what do we know about the peace talks? Well, they were first mentioned on an article that I think was called The Ecology of the Char, and it was touched very briefly on it, just basically saying that the Char are also tired of the protracted war that they have been having with the humans for centuries and centuries. And now, three of the High Legions, and mainly Blood, Iron, and Ash, are thinking maybe we could just get out of this peacefully. The next mention that I know of comes from the very first book that was uh, you know, put out by ArenaNet on Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2 lore, which was called Coasts of Ascalon. In it, I guess the main plot device was that the Char said, you know what, yeah, we want to sign a treaty, but humans have to show us some token, I guess, of wanting to do the same. And uh, for us to even go to the table and sit down and start talking about this, we need something that was lost long ago. And that is what they call the Claw of the Khan Four, which is a really weird weapon. So that's all fine and dandy. They go through a lot of adventures to actually get there. And they retrieve the weapon from the fabled Ascalon city, the City of Ghosts. And uh, they are supposed to be returning with that for the Imperator. I, I don't know. They return the weapon. And that's why we see what we see in Summit Peak, which is a point of interest in the fields of ruin. We see that they are actually set up a tent where they are sitting down and talking about peace. Which is something we never heard of between Char and Human. So that right there is pretty interesting. They are sitting down and they're talking. We, we can see that in game and we can see a lot of people that actually were involved. We can see Dougal is keen uh, or Dougal, whatever. He was one of the main characters in Ghosts of Ascalon. And I think you can get a glimpse of that character in Lion's Arch. And I'm talking about the old Lion's Arch, the one that we had at launch, not the one that is destroyed. At least I haven't seen him since. 
Then uh, we have Ember Doomforge, that was one of the only char that went with uh, Dougal's party to Ascalon City and lived to tell the story and actually bring back the weapon. She is one of the delegates that you can see at Summit Peak. I think you can also get a glimpse of Gullick, that was one of the Norn, but you can only see him in the Iron Marches. I, I don't remember, it's some, somewhere near the Dragon Brand. You actually go into this secluded kind of grove that is not all crystal and desolation as you can see in the rest of the dragon brand because that is the tomb for a another one of the heroes that was in that party that is Kailin the Silvari. So what I'm trying to say is there were a lot of things involved in setting up those char human peace talks that we can see in the fields of ruin. However, it's been almost two years since launch and it's always the same there have been talking for two years I mean yes that can happen I believe that since we want to adhere to what Arena Ned has been saying from the get-go yes we want the world to evolve to feel alive then you know we need some sort of progression and I think that there needs to be a resolution to those those talks that we've been seeing there. What is that resolution? I don't know. We can speculate. Maybe they don't reach any agreement and they get back to fighting, but I don't think that would happen. That would actually compromise the whole idea of forming a pack and bringing the races and the orders together to fight a, a, against a common enemy, namely the Elder Dragons. So there is conflict, obviously, always brewing is to name a few things what we've seen with the recent development about the Silvaris being of the dragon and I'm talking about Mordermoth that right there creates a really interesting conflict but to go back and be seeing the dead horse with, with a stick of human char war we've been there and we've done that so this needs a progression and I guess a peaceful resolution would be nice but something that has to be reflected in game. Okay, that actually brings me to my next point the cleansing of ore by the mostly hated character Traherne. Some people love him, I don't see the appeal in that character. But so, yeah, in the personal story, you basically get to help this guy Traherne, actually, the very first Silvari to walk on Tyria. To complete what they call the wild hunt which is some sort of calling some sort of destiny for the Silvari and his wild hunt was not fighting the elder dragons but was actually cleansing the land of ore which was of course tainted by uh, Saitan's corruption and uh, we do that by going to what they call the artisan waters which is what they call the source of or basically a big spring of water that ran through all the corners of the nation and it was speculated that that is sort of a ley line hub for you know what we know now is magic flowing freely through the entire world and it's actually where the human gods first set foot on the planet so basically what is implied after you do this uh, personal story step after cleansing the source of water, the artisan waters, that sort of pure magic will start healing the land of ore, which should be reflected at some point. We should see at least a decrease on undead creatures, or that the actual land comes back to life, with trees growing again, grass, and getting better there needs to be some progress and that is actually something very interesting because if the land of ore is cleansed is basically a big portion of land that is free for any of the races to claim so who would go there of course what we know ore was originally a human kingdom so wouldn't it be natural that humans would settle that especially since the hold that they have on Crida is frail at best. Some people would also argue that Char conquered those lands before uh, Vizier Kilbron used the dark spell that actually set up the cataclysm that took ore underwater. Anyway, that is up for debate, but I would like to see some progress or some evolution to ore. See what's going to come out of that. Alright, 
of next point would be uh, the login jena relationship i think that needs to be solved somehow we've been left hanging on what's going to happen so can she marry him is she going to openly admit that she loves him or the other way around or is that really a political thing that cannot happen at the moment now i understand that you know leaders can they need to show some strength and maybe marrying logan is uh, a sign of weakness but at the same time Kryda has no successor to the throne and well queen jenna may very well be closing into her prime days and maybe she cannot conceive anymore in a few years so is she just going to leave that like that just cut off the bloodline that is not so smart in my opinion so what would i propose uh, as a resolution for that actually split them for good they don't need to be together and you know who would be a better suit in the political arena and actually as a person for Queen Jenna, Wade Samuelson. He is the commander of the forces stationed at the uh, Evan Hawk stronghold, and he's actually a descendant from the kings of Ascalon. And he's got a pretty good reputation because of what he's done to maintain Evan Hawk still standing for so many years. That would actually strengthen uh, Jenna's position in court, what with all the ministers scheming and plotting against her if she has a strong ally with a different ancestry that actually brings something into the realm well that may actually work in her favor so think about it guys all right so that actually brings me to a different point that was touched upon on season two of the living world story which is the cleansing of Ascalon, something that that Whitlock tried to do by using magdir you know the uh, magical sword that somehow is in his hands we still don't know how he came by that magic sword which is a twin to Sahothin, the one that was used to actually unleash the faux fire spell that created all the ghosts that we see in the Escalonian regions so we know so far from what we've seen in the trailers Redlock is coming back he's coming back as this uh, revenant badass this armor wielding spellcaster of sorts but did he succeed? I don't think so, because we still see the ghosts, we still fight him, but he was onto something, because he opened a portal to the mists and he went there, he did something with that spell that he was trying to cast, we want to see what happened, is Ascalon going to be ghost free in a patch or something, or is it going to stay like that, now I understand, basically it's because uh, new characters need to have some sort of starter enemies, and for new char characters, that is perfect, the conflict against the Ascalonian ghosts, that makes sense. But I'm pretty sure that they can tweak that around and, and, and play with it. Okay, there are no ghosts anymore, maybe now you deal with the ogre invasion, or with the harpies. I'm pretty sure they can figure something out. So, uh, for my next point, let's talk about the Flame Legion. The Flame Legion was the one High Legion that originally controlled the Char 250 years ago, but they fell in disgrace because there were a couple of rebellions that opposed them. They are seeking to regain that control over the Char. They have an Imperator called Kaheron Balefire. So that guy, he's trying to ascend to Godhood by using magic, and he almost succeeds why we are uh, doing the Citadel of Flames, which is a dungeon where you're with Ricklock and Logan. So you actually stop this guy and Flame Legion is thrown into disarray for a while. But they they are still active. And in fact, they join forces under Scarlet. So they put the Flame Legion together with the, uh, the Dredge and form the Morton Alliance. So after we, as the Pact, defeated the Aether Blades and you know this big machine that Scarlet used to wreak havoc on, on, on Lion's Arch. After we defeat Scarlet, what happens with the Flame Legion? Are they still around? Are they still part of the Molten Alliance? Under whose authority? Who's leading them? Do we have any clue about that? I don't believe we do. And that also takes me to the Aether Blades. 
and the dredge, which were the other two points that I wanted to talk about. We don't know about the Aether Blades, that's the last that we heard of them was when they were working with Scarlet and we moved on, we passed that point in the story. Scarlet's dead, but her armies are supposed to be still out there. Again, who's leading them? I think, I think, May Trin, the original captain, took some of them to the mists, but doing what? And are they going to meet with Ridlock? You know, it's some part of the unseen story of how Ridlock became the Revenant that we've seen in the trailers. That is something that needs to be cleared up, or at least touched upon and changed. But as far as I know, ArenaNet has maintained some sort of way of thinking about the missions and dungeons and personal story steps that we've done in the past and that is that they are fixed in time but I would like to see some sort of conclusion to that part of the story then since we spoke a little bit about the destruction of Lion's Heart by the hands of the army that Scarlet put together well what's going to happen to Lion's Heart yes I've heard or is there is some sort of thread on the official forums that Lion's Arch is going to get rebuilt. That is great, that is awesome. Lion's Arch is one of my favorite cities, but how are they going to do that and who's going to do it? I understand the, the guy from the Black Lion Company has been gathering some funds to you know help do that. That actually has me a little excited because that means that something is going to change, something is going to be different in the game. So. Lion Sarge is going to be evolving, showing maybe a different side. Hopefully, we'll get that. I hope this is just not wishful thinking. Anyway, then, you know, close to Lion's Arch, we have the uh, Dominion of Wings, or what we know that is the Tengu City, the Tengu Realm. The Tengu were these bird like creatures that originally came from the continent of Kanta. At some point in the story between Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2, the Emperor of the Dragon Empire decided that, you know what, Kanta for the humans, all non-humans or demi-human races need to go or need to die. So the Tengu fled the continent and uh, sailed to Tyria. They ended up in what was called the Sanctum Bay and they established uh, the Dominion of Winds, which is right now walled and we cannot access, we can just see the outer parts of the city. And uh, you know, during the Lion's Arch destruction, if you came close to that place, the archers from the walls would shoot at you and you had to flee, otherwise you would get killed. So that is really interesting. Uh, it, it's funny because at the same time they were pursued out of Kanta, they had to go into exile, but they are employing the same tactics in the Dominion of Winds. The Dominion of Winds only for the Tengu. That is sort of ironic and uh, I'm pretty sure that it's intentional, which is pretty cool, but are we ever going to see it? Are they going to open their doors? Do they think they're too safe from the Mordormoth attacks or Jormax if eventually we go there? Okay, so next on my list would be the Centaur Human War uh, that they've been having for territory up there in Kryda. You know, they are trying to invade Queensdale and the Harathi hinterlands. And there's a whole war front in the Harathi hinterlands that the Seraph are trying to fight. So, is there going to be a resolution about that? Or are we going to we as humans going to push back against the centaurs and actually win some territory or we gonna exterminate them or is it going to be the other way around well we need to do something and this is kind of the same situation as the Ascalonian ghosts and the cleansing of uh, Ascalon because again centaurs and bandits are mainly starter enemies for new human characters but there must be some way of evolving that into something different. Maybe now we do different hard quests or different type of activities, you know, now that uh, Heart of Thorns is coming, so that we can progress our characters from level 0 to level 20 or 30. We've been killing over and over the Centaurs and Ulgoth and all the events uh, that you can do in the human lands, but is it going to be always the same? I don't think that it should be like that. And uh, now that I mentioned uh, bandits, 
there's something this is something that I actually found out not not so long ago maybe a month ago I was just playing with a new ranger around and I went into the uh, Brisbane wildlands and I noticed something if you go to the northern part of the of the map and go around a hill you're going to find something very particular you will see and I'm trying to show this on the clip that you're watching if you are watching at this and it's not only listening there is a portal that you cannot currently access you know, in the game and it, it's because it's so high and there's no visible way of getting there unless you consider that there are a few bandit engineers that you can actually kill and they are working on a bridge that clearly was there before but was torn down by something or someone it isn't clear maybe storm maybe an elemental that was particularly strong or maybe the seraph did that they are trying to build that bridge and put it together again so they can go to the portal and if they can go we can go i'm really curious about that but they've been hovering the same section of the map for two years we need to see some progress right there where is it leading and why are they trying to go there and since season 2 had a lot to do with bandits and what they were doing in the dry top and the silver wastes well I mean this could tie in there perfectly what are they trying to do with that bridge where are they trying to go who are they trying to contact I really want Arena Net to solve this one for us now I go to a different point that has no relationship to what I was talking about before um, and I'm talking about the steam creatures you remember those they're somewhere around the shiver pigs and they you know they appear out of nowhere and you encounter them kind of randomly around and I think that at some point the developers tried to explain their presence in the shiver pigs as experiments by Scarlet that you know prototypes that she failed on and learned from to make the watch knights that try to take over divinity's reach when she first appeared on story but actually we had seen them before if you go with a new newly created Asuan character through something that they call the infinity ball it, it was part of the story you could go with two different directions with two or three but this was one of the main paths that you can take at the beginning of the story when you were an inventor for the Asuri. The idea is that you created the infinity ball, it was some sort of magic eight ball where you could just try to glean something of the future, but someone else took that project, stole it from your laboratory and enhanced it with some, some matrix or whatever and what they did was they modified the infinity ball to not show you possible futures but possible dimensions and in one of them apparently the darker version of you and some of the characters NPCs they are taking over the world by using these two creatures so they actually are something of your creation where you are an Asuran character not Scarlet whatever apparently at some point the developers and the writers Angel mainly said you know what that doesn't stand anymore which is kind of shitty for them to do pardon my French and they actually said no you know what Scarlet created them and that made no sense but the fact is they are still there and if we have to go with season 1 and 2 lore canon is Scarlet created them so why are they still appearing if we are taking them down and Scarlet is already dead there's no one else to create them we shouldn't encounter them anymore okay good now I want to talk about a race that has been one of my favorites but you cannot play with them and I'm talking about the Coden these big bears that speak really deeply and have this whole philosophy behind them what's going to happen with them as far as I know they were creatures from the far north and these are coming uh, just escaping, trying to escape Jormax corruption and they travel in these huge ship like cities that float on icebergs, I mean how cool is that right? they are trying to get to you know safety so what's gonna happen with them? are they still you know trying to make foot on Hyria from the north? are they going to fight back? are they going to be playable? which would be so cool well food for thought right? Alright, so uh, going back to Or, 
and the cleansing, something that is related is you, when you get the pack together, you start the attack on or you know, to kill Saitan, and you establish a stronghold, which is called Fort Trinity. Well, what's going to happen with that? I mean, you're not going to use it anymore because you already killed Saitan, right? But at the same time, and this is again tying up with what Arena Nail has said, some things need to stay frozen in time because otherwise new characters wouldn't be able to go through the story. And Fort Trinity is a really huge part of what you're trying to do in Or, uh, which is setting up the attack on Saitan. If it goes away or you know it's it becomes unpopulated, so how are you gonna do that? So I need I, I need to see some sort of uh, resolution for this. What where is Arena Nail going to come up for this? But we're not using it anymore because we moved past Saitan. We are on Moldemoth now, and then we'll move to Krakatoric or Kanta or Elona, whatever. But we're not going to touch Hor anymore, right? Because it's going to become cleansed. There's no need for a Fort Trinity anymore. So, um, thank you guys. I wanted to uh, touch on this. Uh, these few things that I believe need to change or to uh, to show some changes in the future uh, with patches and the expansion. But before I go, I wanted to also talk about a couple of things that are really minor, but there are some things that I would like to know. They, they are curious for me about Guild Wars. And uh, the first one of them is Dry Top, which was great when it came out. And you know there was this sandstorm. There still is a sandstorm that is happening every 30 or 40 minutes, and the Sephirites are stranded there because of the sandstorm and how their ship crashed. But what's going to happen? Basically, are they going to move to a different map? Are they going to rebuild the ship, uh, or just use the old one, or are this going to fade into obscurity? But more important than that is. What are the causes of the sandstorm? Why is it happening? Is it just a weather phenomenon or is it something else? Because it seems unnatural and just too well timed. Although you can argue, well, it's mechanics. Something has to happen in the map. So every 40, 30 minutes, a sandstorm comes. But really, is that all? Is there no lore explanation about this? Also, because there's a really interesting point, uh, I think it's on the eastern part of the map where you see all these vines just burying you from going into a place and I want to know what's you know, on the other side is that where we are going to go into the expansion is that the point where the portal would be well uh, I want to know about that so if you know it's touched upon on the expansion I hope that I like it and I hope that you guys do too and the other thing is uh, kind of stupid, but I, I find this race kind of funny. And they, they, I guess they provide a lot of the light humor or humor relief that the game needs at some points. And it's the fact that under the silver waste, we find a really big cavern with a lot of uh, script. And they have a ship that is turned upside down, which is pretty weird. And they seem to have some plans with it. They, they trying to, I guess, fill the cavern with water so that they can sail on that ship somewhere. Is something going to happen with that? I, I'd love to see what's that all about. I'd love to see if they are, you know, they're capable of lifting the, the ship uh, to put it on the right side, or if they are going to fill out the cavern with water. That would be really weird, but, you know, I want to see what's going on there. So there you have it people, this is all I wanted to touch upon, all I wanted to treat in the video. Uh, this is my first time, don't be so harsh, if you liked it, I'm not gonna say subscribe, I'm not really planning on doing any more of this, but just click on like or leave a comment, and thank you very much, see you guys in game.